Okay, thank you very much everyone for coming along. This is uh, certainly our best attended uh, seminar so far this year. Uh, and as you may be aware, uh, the museum for lunchtime seminars is uh, for the first time this year has been very kindly sponsored by Trevor Smith. And uh, we'll be uh, supporting the centre for the next few years. Uh, we're delighted to work with them. And uh, uh, related to that, we're also delighted from time to time to be able to welcome uh, experts from Travers Smith along to share some of their insights uh, which relate to the work that many of us are doing in uh, our respective courses here at Cambridge. So in that regard, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, this afternoon Jeremy Walsh from Travers Smith. Now, we were supposed to have two speakers today, Jeremy Walsh and his colleague Spencer Summerfield. Spencer, unfortunately, is caught up in urgent client business today and won't be able to make it, so Jeremy is kindly holding for a long this afternoon. Uh, Jeremy joined Trevor Smith in 1993 and in 1994 became a partner. He specialises in advising and finance, restructuring and insolvency, in each case acting for financial institutions, private equity sponsors, investors, borrowers, pensions, trust, trustees, directors, insolvency practitioners, and other professionals. So Jeremy's experience of working on a whole range of different clients. And in addition to that, Jeremy is also a licensed insolvency practitioner. And the, the topic that Jeremy will be speaking on this afternoon is UK debt restructuring techniques. And for those of you who are not familiar with the format, Jeremy will speak for approximately 30 35 minutes, and then the remainder of the session on the two again will be dedicated to questions and answers. And I think there will also be a quiz involved as well, which is definitely a first for us. So <laughs> I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you all for coming today. What I plan to cover is the main new um, restructuring techniques that are available in the UK, although some of them are capable of also applying to overseas companies. What we'll do is, having gone through that, uh, open up the seminar to a debate on a hypothetical ec private equity backed group and how, having learned the, the techniques, uh, and there's no single right answer about how one might restructure that group, uh, hence the, the rather fearsome diagram that I, I handed out. I would say that also that a full note of, of what I'm going to talk about today will be available on my firm's website in a few weeks' time. So to just introduce the list of topics that we're going to cover, the various techniques. Well, firstly, contractual techniques. There may well be amendment provisions in existing finance documents. There may also be documents primarily in the intercreditor agreement um, between lenders, um, which can be used to implement a restructuring. And it may also be necessary to use an insolvency procedure, the most likely one being administration. We'll also look at where the centre of main interest of the company is, and whether there might be some advantage in moving that to the UK jurisdiction to implement the restructuring. We look at schemes of arrangement, which you may well have heard of, commonly used for overseas companies as well as English companies, and then an English procedure, the company voluntary arrangement. But I would stress there is no single right answer, no one size fit all, fits all solution. And in the real world, it's absolutely vital to also address not only the capital structure, but the, op the operating businesses. Because if the operating businesses are bust, um, there's no real opportunity to do a financial restructuring. And as a general proposition, if the restructuring can be agreed consensually, that is likely to be in the interest of the business and the stakeholders, but that's not always possible. Um, another general pro proposition is that we would try and limit the restructuring process to holding companies rather than operating companies in that a process at the operating company level is likely to be value destructive and in particular <coughs> English law upholds ipso facto clauses by which counterparties can co terminate contracts or withdraw licenses on insolvency. 
So it's best to keep the opcodes out of the process. Now, if you're restructuring, you may obviously look at where, where you want to get to, but you need to understand where you're starting from. So it's important to understand completely the ranking of the existing creditor claims, which assets are in which companies, which liabilities are in which companies. Two general propositions. One, secured claims, generally speaking, <coughs> rank ahead of unsecured claims. And then an intercreditor agreement may contractually rank the claims as between each other. Uh, and you may well, in your own jurisdictions, have come across the, the LMA, Loan Market Association Intercreditor Agreement, precedent, so not just used in the UK, but all over the world. This is that rather forbidding diagram. And what we're doing at the end is looking at how you might restructure that. But just to elaborate on how understanding creditor claims. On, on the diagram, you'll see that target subs two, three, and four are operating companies. And they've got lease and operating creditors. And they hold, they hold the operating assets. Uh, but notice also that they've given upstream guarantees and security to the senior and junior lenders. Parent, Bidco, Target and Sub1 are hold cap, hold codes. So they too have given guarantees and security to the senior and the junior. They've also, Bidco has also got liabilities under swaps <coughs> to hedge counterparties. The parent and its subsidiaries you'll see that they've also made unsecured intergroup loans. Um, so therefore, they're ranked behind the senior and the mayor's on an insolvency. Holdco and Topco at the top, they've got no liabilities in, in this structure, which is fairly conventional. No liabilities to the, the senior or the mayor's. Therefore, <clears throat> but you'll see that they are being Holdco's they're what we call structurally subordinated to the claims of the creditors against the operating companies. It is only if those lower, lower down claims are satisfied in full would there be any surplus which could ever get up to the top codes. And under the intercreditor, that you'll see that in terms of where the claims lie, the senior and the mes are in the same companies, um, therefore there's no structural subordination. So what you do is, under the intercreditor, is contractually rank the two claims, and generally speaking, the MES principal cannot be repaid ahead of the senior, and generally speaking, the senior will control enforcement. So bear that in mind for when we come to the, the quiz at the end. And it's absolutely vital on, when you're doing a restructuring to know exactly what you're, where you're starting from. <coughs> So there are some background, con before we look at the actual processes, some background concepts to have in mind when you're doing a restructuring. The key one is where does the value break? So if you take our group, and if, that, if the group were to be sold or liquidated, how, how much of the proceeds will be able, available to satisfy creditor claims? So to take an example, say the, the value of the assets is 100 million sterling. But the, the extent of the senior debt is 200 million. We would say that the value breaks in the senior. If there were an extra 100 million of MES debt and the value of the assets were 250 million, the value would break in the MES. And that, that clearly can be disputes about the valuation process. Um, but it's important to understand where the value breaks. Secondly, does the company need protection from its creditors? Um, of the procedures I'm going to talk about, only administration gives an, a moratorium against creditor action, well, other than company voluntary arrangements for very small companies. But any process, as I say, is like, if it's done prematurely or in a free-fall manner, is likely to be value destructive. So it may just have to be accepted that trade creditors continue to be paid during the restructuring process in order to avoid a precipitate insolvency. Next, director's duties. 
there will be pressure points from the directors under U UK law. They're at risk of, well, firstly, if a company is insolvent or of doubtful solvency, the duties that become owed to the creditors primarily rather than the shareholders. And they're also potentially at risk for personal liability and or disqualification if they are liable for what's called wrongful trading, which essentially is where if the company no longer has a, a reasonable prospect of going into insolvent liquidation or administration, interestingly, but the law was changed in October to, to make it applicable on administration, not just liquidation. <coughs> then after that point of no return, they have a duty to take every step to minimize the potential loss to the creditors. If they don't, they're personally at risk. Generally speaking, those situations are manageable with professional advice. Um, but it can lead to pressure points during the restructuring. It also means if a creditor is too aggressive, you can actually push the put make life too difficult for the directors and prejudice the restructuring. Equally, sometimes the directors are just in denial, uh, and a shot across the bounds can, can be quite valuable. You also need to be very careful during a restructuring to make sure that your transactions are unlikely to be set aside as being an undervalue or a, or a preference. And again, only administration provides an automatic insulation against that risk. On any modern restructuring, a common feature will be trading of debt uh, on all levels of, across the capital structure. And that can be a good thing in the sense that it can provide an exit for an unwilling lender. It can be quite dangerous if you've got somebody we'll describe as a holdout creditor who is there just to take a blocking position in voting on the restructuring in return for um, what it hopes uh, a financial advantage. There are extra pressures if the company's securities are listed. Two main points. Firstly, there's a duty to make, make regular announcements of material information which isn't available to the public. That can call, make it very difficult <coughs> on a restructuring in that if you basically have to give a running commentary and put all the dirty laundry into the public arena, it means that, for example, your best employees walk, they get scared and walk, um, and or your suppliers think they're not going to get paid so they're going to demand cash on delivery but you have to comply with the rules of the exchange. And the, the other impact of securities being listed is the insider dealing legislation applies, um, which is, can be a great concern to investors like hedge funds if they're buying into the debt. They actually don't want to have too much non-public information, or if they do, if, if they go restricted for a short period, they will insist that the company regularly cleanses that by announcing this to the market. Again, I mean, it's a fact of life, but it's a compl complication. Last point, slightly techie point, but potentially important, that's Comey, or Centre of Main Interests, that if the company's um, Centre of Main Interest is, is outside the UK, um, you may need or, or wish to bring it to the UK um, to do the re restructuring process. And it's a reasonably well-worn well path um, to start holding your board meetings in the UK and your key creditor meetings. Much easier to do at the whole co-level, relatively hard to do it at the, the operating level. Now turning to the first mechanic, and that's lender consent thresholds. The first thing you have to do is look at your existing finance agreements and look, look at what are the majorities in order to effect a change. If what you're doing is relatively minor, like changing the financial covenants under a traditional LMA um, bank loan facility, that's a two-thirds majority. But if you want to do something more like extending maturity or reducing interest, that will generally be an old lender decision. If you're in the bond market, then the, <coughs> the, generally speaking, the 
threshold to initiate an acceleration is 25%. Enforcement and minor contractual changes, 50.1%. And all remaining decisions, 90%. So if you extend, if you're extending maturity, um, there's a very high threshold. Sometimes you see an additional clause called what's called a structural adjustment clause, where provided you get the two-thirds majority overall and the consent of the lenders of a particular class that are affected, then that can go, go through without it being an all-lender decision. Then we turn to the intercreditor release mechanisms. These are, so it's a contractual construct, very, very powerful, arguably as powerful as the scheme of arrangement, which we'll come to, and has not yet been seriously challenged in the courts. What it basically does is where there's a distressed disposal, i.e. essentially in a, an enforcement scenario, then and there's the senior creditors, if they can inf enforce their security by selling the shares, say, in, in Bidco, or an administrator doing that, so we have a distress disposal. Then the security agent, which holds the security for the syndicate, has power to basically eliminate or transfer and eliminate the claims of the junior creditors. So I'll take our scenario where the value is breaking in in the senior, and the, the mayors will not simply agree to release their claims. Then the senior can move the assets into a new code controlled by the senior lenders. Now if the MES, as we saw earlier, the operating companies have generally given guarantees and security for the junior debt, if that debt and security stays in place, they effectively have a veto. So what the intergreditor allows the security agent to do in a distressed disposal situation is to remove those guarantees and security. It has. I'm generalising slightly in that it's very, very important to check the precise wording of the intercreditor. I, I've largely been referring to the LMA standard, but that's open to all sorts of negotiation and drafting slips. So if, if you're dealing with this in practice, look very carefully at the drafting to make sure the release mechanics do what you think they're going to do. But under, under the standard, the security as the agent has the duty to get the fair price, and there are ways of proving that, which would include a sale through an administrator. So just just bear in mind that the, the release mechanisms of the creditor are very powerful. Now administration. It's now the preeminent insolvency process in the UK, um, both as a means of protection at the, at the instance of the directors or a means of enforcement for the secured creditors. And the administrator has primary duty, if he can, is to rescue the company, failing which to achieve a better result for the creditors as a whole, failing which a realisation for the secured creditors. And as I mentioned earlier, it may well be that as part of a restructuring, if it's necessary to, if the, if the value is breaking in the senior, if it's necessary to move the assets out of the existing capital structure into a senior controlled new capital structure, administration is a very powerful and effective way of achieving that. Um, it's very, the advantage of administration compared, for example, with a the security agent as mortgagee selling the shares is that a sale by the administrator will not be capable of challenge as, as an undervalue. Clearly the administrator needs to satisfy himself that proper value is obtained. And these are often called pre-packaged administrations in that the, all, the work, all the work to agree the, the terms of the sale and, and obtaining evidence of value is all done prior to the administrator being appointed and exercising his discretion to authorise that transaction 
he will enter into that immediately after he's appointed. So, so, so far as the public are concerned, um, there's very little effect on, or, on the business. They have been criticised in terms of lack of, tra lack of transparency, um, but provided that, that proper efforts are made to establish value, that they're a very useful restructuring tool. Um, <clears throat> but as I mentioned, it's best to do that at the holding company level because contracts and licenses at the op OPCO level can be terminated in insolvency. There are, in other jurisdictions like the US, there are restrictions on exercise and such clause, but we haven't yet caught up. If you're going to do a administration, you need to have the code in England and Wales. So if we're doing this from an overseas company, then you'll, you'll, you'll need to do a Comey shift. Now, schemes of arrangement. What is it? Well, it's a statutory <coughs> procedure under Part 26 of the Companies Act. Um, just a few sections in the Companies Act. Very little guidance in the legislation as to what, what you can do in terms of creditor schemes, which has been jolly useful because it means we can, within reason, do all sorts of things. Slight word of caution, what I'm going to say is based on what little case law there is, and what case law there is, is generally at first instance and often unopposed, um, but has formed the basis of market practice in any event. Now what it allows you to do is reach an arrangement or compromise with creditors within certain limits and <clears throat> that will bind each of the members and creditors of the, of the relevant class um, provided that the requisite majorities are achieved and provided that the court sanctions the scheme. Very, very importantly, it's the only procedure available <coughs> under English law to compromise the claims of secured creditors without their consent. Um, and that's really, we've seen an awful lot of that during the last decade, uh, and, the, and the, the scheme has come, come of its own. It's so, like word of warning, if you use the word scheme with an American lawyer, um, they, tr they think it means a scam or, or a fraud. Um, you have to reassure them that's just what it's called. It's not a scam. But scheme, scheme has a, a, another meaning for them. Um, and the scheme is generally initiated by the company itself. Just a few examples of what a scheme has been used for in practice. It's been used to compromise secured or unsecured claims or change the ranking to affect what we call an amend and extend. So we amend the terms and ex ex extend duration um, to affect debt equity swaps to introduce new debt tranches or facilities, and to transfer business and assets to new codes. So, very powerful. There are a number of things the scheme can't do. Firstly, you can't simply remove a party's rights for no consideration. There's got to be, albeit not necessarily huge, but an element of give, or give and take. Nor can it deal with um, proprietary claims for trust property where the beneficiary is not a creditor and generally what it can't do is impose additional new obligations to provide new credit although the point was left open in APCO 2 last year as to whether a simple rollover on existing terms might be something a court could, could, could sanction. Now, most importantly what a scheme cannot do of itself is cram down junior creditors or shareholders unless they, unless they agree or are voted in favour because you don't need to involve in a scheme any party who on the evidence doesn't have an economic interest in the outcome. So if they're junior creditors and there's evidence the valuation is senior, you don't need to involve them in the scheme process and you know, expect they might vote against it. But what it does mean is if they're not involved in the process, then their claims are not compromised. So what, how you see that used 
is if you haven't got unanimity amongst the senior, you do a scheme to buy, buy the, and you've got the requisite majority, you do a scheme to buy the senior, and then you combine it with the release mechanism. Well, you, you, you also have a distressed disposal, so either administration sale or a mortgage sale, and ha where you have a distressed disposal, you use the intercreditor mechanics to disenfranchise the mess. So if a client comes to you saying, I want to do a scheme, it may well be that as well as the scheme, you need to build into it these other elements. Short outline of the procedure. Um, once you've agreed the terms, and that can take months or years, then you need to apply to court for permission to convene meetings of creditors and to agree the the classes um, who are going to vote on the scheme, and I'll come back to that. <coughs> then at your meeting it needs to be required, uh, approved by the requisite majority, which is a majority in number and 75% majority by value in each class. Um, in practice, the parties involved will try very hard to get as high an approval threshold as possible to minimise challenge. And then finally, there have been applications to, to court to sanction a scheme um, where there are reasonably settled principles, and that's not, not simply a rubber, rubber stamping exercise. Um, but I would say in fact, uh, the judges are very commercially aware, uh, and the courts are very ready to assist parties where time of the, of, is of the essence um, to get a scheme approved. <coughs> Now, as regards the composition of classes, this is probably the, the key area, and there's no guidance of itself in the Companies Act on how the classes should be composed. In Sovereign Life Assurance and DOB, the, the classic test was a class must be combined to those persons whose rights are not so dissimilar as to make it impossible for them to consult together with a view to their common interest. Now, what and what we need to be clear on is the court is focused on rights rather than interests. So you look at you know, the strict legal rights of creditors versus the company. Now, if, other, if creditors have got a particular agenda, say they're connected with the shareholders, that shouldn't of itself um, mean they're in a separate class, although that can be argued. Um, it may be relevant when we come to the sanction stage, and I'll explain about that in, in a minute. But one area where the courts have looked at the class issue is where <coughs> the parties have entered into what's called a lock-up agreement. These are quite common because you want as much certainty as possible if you're promoting a scheme that the, the creditors are going to support it. And in a lock-up agreement, at its simplest, there's, there's generally agreement to give the company time to implement the scheme and require them to support the scheme, perhaps based on no material departures from the agreed term sheet. And they may be offered a fee in return for signing up. The court has upheld that process, in particular paying a fee, but it didn't create a separate class provided that it wasn't a materially significant amount and was available to all the creditors. Um, but if, if, if one were thinking of challenging the scheme, the potentially vulnerable point is the, is, is, is the classes, because if that's wrong, the court doesn't ever have um, <coughs> jurisdiction to sanction the scheme. Now, talking about sanction, at the sanction hearing, the court will look at have the statutory requirements been met, were the meetings convened, were the requisite majorities um, in favour of the scheme, was each class fairly represented, and was the statutory majority acting bona fide in the interest of the class? So that's the point at which, if certain creditors have got particular vested interests, the court will assess. Um, Ha, ha, what weight or not to be given to those separate interests. 
And the court also has to be satisfied that the scheme terms were, were fair. So objectively, an intelligent and honest person might reasonably have approved the scheme. In practice, there's all sorts of negotiations going go on behind the scenes before the, the scheme is promoted to try and iron out these issues. And a lot of the parties will be involved in one scheme and their conduct of one scheme might be held either in their favour or against them on the next scheme. So in, in, in the commercial world, um, a, lot of done, a, lot, a, a lot of the action um, is, is done off stage. Now, schemes and overseas companies um, <coughs> to be eligible for jurisdiction, the company must be one which is liable to be wound up under the Insolvency Act. Now, that what that means is it's a, bit, a sort of company that's capable of being wound up. It doesn't mean it necessarily would be. And the English court well, that won't wind up a company unless there's a legitimate interest. And the courts established three, three guidelines for legitimate interests. The most important one of which, there has to be sufficiently close connection with the UK. Ordinarily, that would mean that it's establish, establishment or place of business or Comey. And actually, if, if, if a Comey shift is practical, you might well do it to be absolutely certain of jurisdiction for a scheme. But the court have recently found that um, sufficient connections simply on the basis that the finance documents are governed by English law. They even in APCOA last year accepted jurisdiction where the governing law clause in, in the fa facility agreement was originally German law. And that was changed to English law to then uh, give jurisdiction for a scheme. I wouldn't run away too much with the thought that one can always do that. In that in case, the practitioners were very clear up front when they were seeking consent to change the governing law that the purpose was to do a scheme. And it was a rather old facility agreement in that pre-2012, um, change of governing law was but, um, under the LMA standard a majority decision. Since 2012, the precedent has, has made it an all-lender decision. So we, we, that, may, that route may not be open on a more modern facility. Um, nor will the court sanction the scheme um, without some evidence that the scheme will be recognized and enforced abroad, either f full recognition or practical recognition through the court, local court's willingness to grant an injunction to stop somebody enforcing on the basis of the pre-restructured <coughs> finance documents. Um, just in briefly in terms of scheme documentation, um, when you're dealing with a scheme in practice, it's useful to think of it just as a wrapper for the commercial deal. And what this, the scheme document will generally do is exhibit the form of restructuring agreement, which will itself then exhibit all agreed forms of financing documents, share transfers. Um, I mean, it is a huge exercise. But the scheme is just the wrapper to give authority for the, for the parties to enter into it. Um, briefly, the last form of restructuring process we have in the UK is a company voluntary arrangement or, or CVA. Um, to a degree it's the analogy with a scheme, however, um, you cannot compromise secured claims in a CVA without the creditor's consent. Um, where it has been found to be very useful um, is with um, landlords compromising landlord claims. We acted a few years ago on the case of Black's Leisure. Black's, like other retailers, had a number of performing shops, which were trading quite well. Some which were hopeless and had in fact been closed, and some in the middle. And provided that you give the landlord a better return than they get on the liquidation, so in this case we're getting a share of a 
a, a pot of money. And that you're, you can objectively justify the categories that you put the landlords into, then you can um, compromise their claims. For example, by get a rent-free period or moving them from quarterly to monthly rents. Um, and of course, in that scenario, you don't compromise the claims of all the other trade creditors so that they, they will vote in favour of it. The procedure is a bit different from a scheme. You have to file various documents at court, but there's no requirement for sanction. And you don't, generally speaking, have different classes. Although if uh, the majority is 75% again, if a lot of that is made up of connected creditors, and they bear a majority of unconnected creditors opposed to the scheme, then it won't be approved. The market practice is to have what's called a, and it's not in the legislation, but a <coughs> burning platform. You have to be able to say credibly to creditors that if you don't approve this, this CVA, then it's going to have to go into liquidation or administration, PDQ, and you'll get a worse result. Um, CVOs can be challenged on the grounds either of uh, material irregularity in the process or unfair prejudice of the, of the creditor. And that will come back to what I was saying about you need to be able to justify objectively how you, if you're treating one creditor differently from another. And there is a 28-day cooling off period during which if the creditors' meetings has approved the CBA, um, an agreed creditor has a month with, with, within which to put a claim for unfair prejudice, which isn't really very satisfactory in terms of deal execution, because you are in limbo for another month, and you may have to cut deals to, to deal with any challenge. So you, on, on the big financial restructurings, you, you won't see the CBA with us if it's just all secured debt. If there's unsecured bonds, it might be something you think about. And with that, um, we can turn to our little diagram. <coughs> Which you won't be able to see on the screen. So. Um, if we just think about first assumption, if the value breaks in the senior debt, anybody any thoughts on how, what a restructuring might look like? I would stress there's no single right answer. And it can be all sorts of deal specific factors which will influence the actual design. Jeremy, this is probably a really silly question. No. But, uh, uh, could, could you just just briefly explain what uh, value breaks means? Yes, value break is where if you were to sell or liquidate the, the company or the group, the proceeds would be insufficient to pay all of the senior debt, and wouldn't be wouldn't be able to pay any of the junior debt. So in this scenario, on, and taking this valuation as, as being correct. The junior lenders have no economic interest in the outcome, the senior do. But under, under our starting structure, <coughs> the, senior, the juniors still have guarantees and securities of the junior to, to cover the junior debt. Um, I mean, just just to, to walk, walk through this, well, the first thing you look at, I say it breaks in the senior. Actually, how bad is it? Because if, it, if it's seriously bad, then any amount of financial restructuring is un unlikely to solve it. So you would probably put the whole group into administration, um, ideally pre-packaged, following a, a limited marketing process, to at least get as, as much back for the senior as you can. Um, but let, let's assume it's bad but not turned on. Then <coughs> the senior will want to restructure and that might well be, for example, changing the terms of the, 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 the performing senior debt 
and converting the, the balance into equity. Um, if the senior are uh, so, <coughs> so changing the terms of the senior debt probably means pushing it out, extending maturity, changing the coupon, which would be an all lender decision. So, next question is are the seniors unanimous on this? If they are, then you deal with that, contra that, that aspect of it contractually. If not, um, but you've got 75% in favour, then you might do a scheme amongst the senior to change the terms of the, of the senior debt. But we've still got the, the, the junior creditors with their guarantees and security from the opcos. Um, first, we're going to ask them, will you either voluntarily offer a modest amount of money to save us the, the time and the effort, will you agree to transfer your claims to us or, or relinquish them? Um, and, and you have a similar conversation with the shareholders in the existing capital structure. Um, if they say yes, then you deal with that consensually and contractually. If they don't, you need a way to get rid of the, the junior guarantees and security, which would involve, and we know we can bring that about by having a distressed disposal, moving the existing hold co into a, a senior control hold co, um, either through administ pre pack administration or you, and or you or a mortgagee sale of the shares um, and provided you've got fair value the security agent will be authorised to release those the mayor's debt guarantees and security. Now if the family were to break in the junior debt then on the face of it the senior are unimp unimpaired And the, most of the restructure ought to take place at the junior creditor level. Um, commercial questions would arise, well, are the junior willing to buy out the senior? Uh, maybe a simpler solution. If the juniors want to promote their own restructuring, is that unanimous amongst the junior? If yes, fine, do it contractually. If not, and you've got 75% of the junior on side, you could scheme to, uh, amongst the junior creditors. You've probably got to also restructure the senior, uh, because if the business has been performing well, but not well enough, um, you may need to, be, to push out the maturity of the senior. And again, if that's not unanimous amongst the senior, then it may be that debt trading makes it become unanimous. Um, you would perhaps do a scheme amongst the, the, the senior as well. To, so you have a senior scheme to restructure the senior and a more drastic scheme amongst the junior, again, to push out the maturity and or do a, a debt equity swap. Can I just ask a quick question? Mm. If you've got a appropriate intercreditor release provision in place, mm -hmm. would that completely preclude all these issues you spoke about, if the value breaks in the junior debt, or I mean, it's a situation you're talking about, a situation where there's no there's higher no, provision for intercreditor release, or, or there's no need to to do a distressed disposal. Okay. Yeah. May I ask a question as regards opposing shareholders? Um, is the ultimate threat um, as regards those shareholders? that they don't have a say in administration, be pushed out, or are there any other mechanisms beyond the administration? Um, you're, you're, I think you're right. Um, general, it's a weakness of the UK system. There is no automatic way of, of dealing with the, the shareholders who want to stay within the existing capital structure. I think in other jurisdictions, I mean, including Germany, there are ways of of, de of dealing with that. So basically you have to threaten the shareholders. We, we will move the asset. You're at the top, your structure is subordinated. We will move the assets into a new code controlled by the creditors. 
and some shareholders just as a matter of principle and work with us, like, go ahead and, and do that. Others I've seen cut a deal where for a modest amount of money, which is less than the cost of doing a scheme and an administration, um, for a quiet life, there's a commercial deal to be done. Sorry, Jim, yeah. to stop you there. No, no not at all. No. Uh, and finally, if the Comey is outside England and Wales, um, the impact of that is, well, you could still do a scheme. You can't do an administration. So if you need to do an administration as part of or in connection with your restructuring, uh, if administration is important, you would have to do a Comey shift to achieve that. You could avoid that by having a scheme and, the, and a distressed disposal by way of mortgagee sale of the shares as opposed to administration. Um, but the mortgagee um, will have to be, get themselves very comfortable as to, as to value. Um, I'd say, uh, <coughs> in, to do your scheme, you still have to establish sufficient connection. With English law, and I say the classic example at the moment is um, use of English law finance documents. So I can say that these are all options, no one size fits all, but there's lots of flexibility. And in practice, you would, if you, you would always try and do a consensual contractual restructuring, but you need to be ready to do, by way of a contingency plan, your plan B, to be able to have a, which will work should the need arise, and showing plan B to the stakeholders may well be enough to get them to buy into plan A. So there's lots of, the schemes that you see are not the sum, sum total of the restructurings. Um, we've actually done a number of cases where we've done enough work on the would-be scheme and or administration and integrated to release to be able to persuade the stakeholders to just do it contractually. Because plan B can make plan A look quite attractive. Any more questions? Uh, uh, just on that last point, yes. uh, uh, are there examples of forum shopping with Comey shifts? Uh, for example, particular creditors cushioned? for certain jurisdictions to be used because that would be with their interests? A, a, a creditor, <coughs> the creditor community are generally happily, happy with English law um, or, or German law, um, generally unhappy about French law, which is you know, very debtor friendly. Um, now I should, I should have stressed, I've obviously talked about English law because I'm an English lawyer. But if it's an English company, you might well look at other jurisdictions. For example, some years ago, when one of the cable companies went into uh, restructuring in the US, we actually had a couple of the English companies that issued the bonds. And we put, and <coughs> we put that, those companies into um, simultaneous Chapter 11 in the States and the administration in the UK to be able to then restructure those bonds through a Chapter 11 plan of real, reorganisation. So, you know, part of the analysis, even for an English company, is are there other jurisdictions that we, we might want to forum shop? Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 To the situation they are able to, to negotiate, and it seems to me that the in the creditor is is one argument why theory might be right. Um, yes. Um, because often um, practitioners say as regards theory that, that it doesn't work. People don't anticipate what will happen. They will they will see the problem and then start acting and then go to the to the options they have. Um, so my question would be. In your practice, if you look at how the creditors are negotiated and, and how 
clauses are negotiated. You mentioned the, the release clauses of yes. Adolf Julius. Would you say that this is um, informed, efficient contracting taking place? And are the actors anticipating insolvency, or is it rather a kind of rule of thumb, roughly going along? How, how, would you, how, how do you see that in the practice? I think every so often, the there, there is a restructure which, which has problems, and then the LMA develop their, their standard form. And the first version of the LMA into creditor was completely senior friendly, and the protections around fair value um, have been brought in following negotiations on various deals with, with the, the MES creditors. And there are some MES, MES houses which have a stronger bargaining position than others. But then that tends to gravitate towards um, a common position. Um, interestingly, or potentially, a lot of MES debt, well, it's, it's relatively unusual to see MES on a new facility. Um, a fairly recent development of what's called a unit tranche, which is, as, as the name suggests, just one visa borrower, one, one ranking, one tranche of debt and behind the scenes the participants in the unit unit charge enter into an agreement between lenders as to, as to sort of effectively a mini mini interpreter behind the scenes um, those have not yet been stress tested on the restructuring be interested to see, see how they would work on the scheme because as, as against the company there's only, only one set of legal rights but behind the scenes differing um, in fact, are quasi tranches behind, behind the unit tranche. In terms of the way these are negotiated, they're, they're generally negotiated at four o'clock in the morning by people who haven't slept for three day, days and nights. Um, some are better negotiated than others. On a, on a very complex new intercreditor, inter people are trying to contract for the first restructuring. And the second restructuring, and so on, all sorts of hypotheticals, you know, for good and valid reasons. Clients are not particularly interested in it. Lawyers love it, but you know, that it's a very powerful document. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Under what circumstances would a scheme of arrangement maybe be preferred in practice to the administration procedure? Given that you said that that's the most popular of these things. The administration procedure is still an insolvent. It is, is an insolvency process. If you do it through a prepack, you can minimise some of the downside. The scheme is still thought of because the company doesn't have to be insolvent. Um, and it's a company's app procedure. Um, I quite like administration. You, 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 you can actually achieve quite a lot with it. But it, it does have the stigma of an insolvency process. That said, if you're able to keep that action very much at the holding company level, rather than the operating, the, 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 it may not register with the, with the public. And also, whilst the court will uphold ipso facto clauses, termination clauses, most clauses will be drafted in a way which only affect the direct counterparty rather than it also extend the reference to the insolvency of a holding company. Although you, you have to check that. Just one question you spoke on from what I said there. Yeah. I'd never thought about this before, but a scheme of arrangement in a distressed company then that wouldn't but that would normally be classed as a uh, as a credit event as such in the way that a liquidation or even an um, administration would. It, uh, it depends how it's drafted. For for many purposes, um, it would be drafted. It, although it's not an insolvency process to the public at large, yeah, it will generally be included as an insolvency event. Ah, so you still couldn't get out yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, or credit event. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just explore my yeah. position a minute? Uh, whenever I've taught this topic, specifically in schemes of arrangement, 
in the, the rare occasions where I have talked to it, because I normally try to try to avoid <laughs> leaving to people like you that actually know what they're talking about. But uh, I think when when you try and teach this topic academically, you, you naturally you pick up on case law, cases like like mentioned sovereign life assurance and Dodd, Hellenic in general, which I hated to never <laughs> read that. Uh, and uh, the big issue, as it stands out, for reading this topic in, in the books and textbooks, seems to be the issue that you mentioned about defining classes, yes. what constitutes a class, rights versus interests, these sorts of issues. Uh, and I wonder, but from what you've said in other parts of your talk today, uh, and this kind of goes back to Felix's question about efficient private order mechanisms. Uh, if you've got, uh, if you've got, for example, inter creditor release provisions, or appropriate deals would be done otherwise between creditors behind the scenes, then would class definition ultimately really be a problem if all that groundwork had been done anyway? Surely, dissent members of potential classes should have been silenced or otherwise taken care of beforehand. So I suppose my question is, if we get a sovereign life assurance and the issue before the court, and there is this dispute about how have the classes been properly defined, is it simply because the solicitors involved just haven't done their job properly? Um, well, they, they've done it, they've pushed it as far as possible, um, and, the, and the respective clients have not reached agreement. And they said, um, APCOA 2, the judgment there is quite a, an interesting um, story of the battle between Centrebridge, who were described as a loan to own vulture, and FMS, who were just described as a, a holdout creditor. <coughs> and FMS actually should have done more at the um, convening stage. Um, basically, came up with all sorts of arguments as to why they were in a separate class, because they hadn't been involved in providing super priority funding. They weren't party to various agreements by their own volition. And the court was fairly robust with them. Um, the issue was um, held over until the sanction hearing. And the court was very much, a, but it didn't like a holdout creditor. Um, and was quite willing to say that um, people having other interests within reason um, quite clearly didn't put them in a different class, but the court looked very carefully at the sanction hearing. And I think the court is cognizant of the fact that if the classes are, are not correct, then there's no jurisdiction to approve the scheme. And it's quite reluctant to give up that jurisdiction or to allow it to be exploited by allowing giving smaller creditors a veto if there's a proliferation of classes, and then to deal with it at the um, sanction hearing. And if necessary, making some, doing a bit of tinkering to the final version of the scheme, as happened on APCO to, to, to provide sanction. In, in, in reality, is it difficult to distinguish between a minority creditor who happens to, to have a genuine claim to be a different class versus the situation of a minority creditor who's just plain awkward? Yes. yes. Is, that, is that an easy distinction to make in practice? You, you, you tend to, for example, know a holdout, holdout creditor when you see one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, final brief question. In a minute or so we've got them here. In that case, well, just, 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 to, just to leave you with this thought, um, that I actually think debt restructuring is best, one of the best forms of legal practice a lawyer can do, but you should never forget the impact on the clients. Neil Gillis, who was the CEO of Blacks, who did a CBA, uh, was quoted in the Telegraph as saying, it was the worst three months of my life. <laughs> Which, given that he was also director of Fairpack, I think it's quite something. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good note to bring us to a close. And uh, certainly, personally speaking, I've learned more about this topic in the last hour than I think you have in the last 10 years. So, thanks to your credit, Jeremy, and thanks for your short appreciation for an extremely interesting presentation this afternoon. So, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you.